All right, so I'm going to drop in the chat box. If you were to visit the Pride and Less Prejudice website, this is the landing page that you would find. Um, as you can see, um, our mission is to foster inclusive books for kids. We provide LGBTQ plus inclusive books to pre-K through third grade classrooms to help students and teachers read out loud and read out proud. Over the past three years, Pride and Less Prejudice has raised funds to send more than 7,500 books to more than 3,000 classrooms. And again, that's across the United States and Canada. We also offer teaching guides for 44 of those selections currently, and we offer regular workshops like this one uh, to try to support educators in their use of the books that we are sending. We also on our website offer a range of author content um, as well as interviews and some uh, read alouds with permission of the publishers to help further your connections with the text. So um, to explain the picture book selections, when we say book bundles, and if you were to look around under our books on that PLP tab, every year Pride and Less Prejudice selects roughly 15 books to share with educators. This year it was 17 and there are so many of them and thankfully there are more and more from which to choose every year. So um, we are delighted about that. The book selection is an annual process and we do that with input from staff within Pride and Less Prejudice uh, who have expertise in children's literature and in childhood education. Um, and if you have suggestions for books for next year's bundle, also feel free to drop those into the chat. We'll start looking at the 2023-2024 book list soon. So we send those book lists for free to educators across the United States and Canada, and again, to pre-K through third grade classrooms right now. But that also includes librarians who work with those students, um, the classroom educators, but school support staff, such as school counselors uh, and others. So once you receive a bundle of books from Pride and Less Prejudice, that's awesome. We wanna help you use them. And then we wanna help other educators have access to our resources as well. So we are currently asking that you not reapply for bundles as awesome as our book selections are right now. Um, and if you are looking for a way to continue supporting the work of Pride and Less Prejudice, then we do actually have a bookshop landing page where you can see uh, this year's selections and all previous selections as well as some helpful recommended reading lists, um, board books, middle grade books, some swoon worthy YA is on there. So um, if you are looking to ship books in the US, then maybe check out our bookshop page for some inspiration. So uh, next slide, please. All right, so this year's selections, as I said, include 17 books. Our goal in bringing you these titles tonight is to help equip you um, as recipients of these books or patrons who have checked them out from the library or purchased them for your own use. We wanna help you incorporate them successfully into your classroom and library conversations. Um, we hope that we'll be able to answer questions that you might have about using these or similar books in your classroom uh, and again, as I mentioned, you will see some uh, slight duplication of titles over the evening. We're gonna try to break them into kind of digestible chunks for you. And we are gonna start with these four books. So to kick us off tonight, we're gonna begin with Calvin. This is written by J.R. and Vanessa Ford with illustrations by Kayla Heron, and it is from Putnam Penguin Books. Calvin always knew that he was a boy, and the night before the family summer trip to visit his grandparents, Calvin lets his parents know too. Calvin's family embraces this acknowledgement with love and a great deal of support, but Calvin is still a bit worried about being the only transgender kid at school. Calvin's friends and his school community welcome him back, and he is heartened to see his name on his cubby, on his desk, uh, on the lunch chart, everywhere at school. And this affirming story mirrors the experience of the author's own child, and they offered this book as an example of how transgender kids can thrive when properly supported. Our next title is Jacob's School Play, starring He, She, and They by Ian Hoffman, Sarah Hoffman, with illustrations by Chris Case. This is from Imagination Press, which is an imprint of the American Psychological Association. This is actually the third in the Jacob series, focusing on a group of kindergartners. In this story, Jacob's class 
Stage is a performance that allows every student to have their moment in the spotlight. Along the way, the classroom teacher helps Jacob understand the difference between gender expression and gender identity, which leads Jacob to an increased empathy towards an understanding of his non-binary classmate, Ari. This is a nice addition to classroom sets for introducing pronouns. Next, we have My Sister Daisy by Adria Carlson with illustrations by Linus Kersey, and this is from Capstone. This book actually has some similarities to Calvin, but this picture book uses first person text and is from an older brother's perspective. It focuses on the family unit's understanding of the child's gender identity. And I really appreciated that this story shows a very realistic range of a sibling's responses, um, their desire to get it right after a sibling transitions and their frustration when they misgender or misname their sibling. Uh, along with a little bit of jealousy throughout the process. So this too is based on the author's family experience. And then to wrap up this set, we have Teo's Tutu by Marianne Jacob Macias with illustrations by Aaliyah Marley. This one is from Dial, another Penguin book. Teo is a dancer. Teo loves ballet. Teo loves bhangra. Teo loves to dance wearing his tutu because it makes him feel special on the inside and it reminds him of a wonderful performance that he saw of Swan Lake. When it comes time to choose costumes for a dance recital, Teo worries that the lavender leotard and tutu might bring him the wrong kind of attention. In the end, Teo chooses what makes him sparkle on the inside and makes his heart shine and his parents and ballet teacher offer their full support. All right, next slide, please. And now Alana is going to talk to us about Teo's tutu. Thank you, Kit. Um, so we're going to get started with Teo's tutu tonight. Um, I'm really excited because everything I'm getting to share with you um, are all activities or projects that I've done in my own classrooms with um, kids kindergarten through third grade. So really excited to show these to you and show you how they work across um, that grade span as well. Um, we can go ahead to the next slide, please. For Teo's Tutu, I immediately thought about an activity called gender boxes. Um, in this activity, um, what I like to do is put out two pieces of paper on my rug, a pink piece of paper and a blue piece of paper. And then can you go to the next slide, please? Um, after that, I give students cutouts of toys, pictures of toys. And I, I don't say anything about the color of the paper at all. I just ask them one by one to choose where they're going to put the toy on the pink paper or on the blue paper. And we start to have a conversation and a discussion about where students are placing certain toys. Um, in my most recent kindergarten classroom, this started out in a way that you might imagine with quote unquote boy toys going on the blue side and quote unquote girl toys going on the pink side. Um, until one student got the Lego cut out and she said, I love to play with Legos. So I don't think that this should go on either side. I want to put it in the middle. And that started an entire conversation in our class um, where slowly the papers got moved away and the pictures all got put in the middle. And it let, led us to a whole conversation that Toys are not, are not a gender, right? Anyone can play with anything that they love. Um, everyone gets to play with anything that they enjoy. And this leads very naturally um, up the grade bands to a lot of conversations about um, the spectrum of, of gender identity, right? That there aren't things that are binary that are boy or girl, but that there's this whole spectrum that we all get to enjoy the things that we love to enjoy. Um, and that we get to play with everything. This is also a really great way to start off a school year. Um, I especially love it in a kindergarten classroom where you have lots of different um, options for play, like a dress up area and a dollhouse and trains, trucks, cars. And it really opens up that conversation during those play times as well that you know, we all get to play with everything. Everyone gets to dress up in all the costumes that they want to dress up in. Um, and it just starts the year off on a really um, 
opening and welcoming community. I'll, I'll hand it over to Elisa to talk a little more about Teo's Tutu. Thanks, Alana. So that activity that the gender boxes process and that activity really exposes something that um, the artist Maya Gonzalez, uh, when referring to children, can sometimes call it the boy girl lie. And I think that that's helpful language too. Um, if you aren't familiar with the artist Maya Gonzalez and the gender wheel framework, I definitely recommend you check that out. But as you are reading this book, I think that like the read aloud component, it is so important to truly embrace gender freedom because there can always be a strong compulsion to categorize and define things, especially in what Western culture. And um, it is so common in kids developmentally in the early childhood years, they're making sense of the world. They're putting all these puzzle pieces together based on what they're seeing around them and how they're socialized. and this is where when conversations around books like this, I think many well-intentioned people can accidentally reaffirm stereotypes as they're trying to dismantle them. So I think this particular book is especially a helpful tool because it offers a chance to discuss how Teo uses he, him pronouns and he likes dressing up and dancing how he likes to dance and he likes to be comfortable. Teo is just himself and that is all we know about Teo, and that is great. We aren't trying to label Teo or make any other assumptions about him. And I think that this book and conversations around it can show that it is okay not to know someone's gender or what their pronouns are, and you can still welcome them. And similarly, you don't have to know everything about yourself to explore your gender and see how things feel in all sorts of ways and contexts. And sometimes that exploration is how you learn more about yourself. So I just think it's helpful to remember that the more casual and open we can be about all this, the better. Um, I think lots of folks already know children are not too young to know their gender clearly, and many do in early childhood. And some people continue exploring their gender as they age. So it can be fixed, but it doesn't have to be. And all of that is just normal and healthy. And um, what isn't natural is heterosexism and a violent, rigid sort of subscription to the gender binary. So if we're having constant check-ins with each other, if we're listening to children and we're learning alongside them and trusting them when they tell us who we are and what makes them feel good, I think we're in good shape. Um, so this leads me to the next slide, which is a great way that this book can be used for conversations and collage. And this is sort of like the, the bookend to the gender boxes because this is a collage activity where you throw a bunch of ideas and toys out there and you just allow kids to explore and wonder, what makes me feel good? What do I like? What feels right for me? So they're crafting their own box. And what I love about this is it can get deep really quickly. <laughs> It's really appropriate for uh, people to select like a picture of a cloud or a picture of moss to be aligned with their sense of self. And it's a great chance for them to consider their other intersecting identities too, like their racial identity, their gender, their ethnicity, alongside all sorts of other things, like what kind of food they like or what toys they like. And it's all relevant and it's all welcome. Um, I also think it's important to name that a book about costumes is perfect imaginative play and dress up. Don't be afraid of play, especially in early childhood. Play is serious business. Um, helps with gross motor skills. It helps with problem solving, creative thinking, language development, cooperation, uh, acting out scenarios, helps with self-regulation. And um, what better way to collaborate and test out new ideas and identities um, in a comfortable and safe environment. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think folks are uh, sometimes worried about overhearing statements that might give them pause. And a helpful reminder, if you don't know what to say, is just to like stop and ask a kid what makes you say that. If you hear, uh, if they're doing the gender boxes activity and a kid says, boys can't wear that, um, what makes you say that is a helpful question to ask. And um, another thing that might be helpful to just have 
in your toolbox is, you know, some people think that only boys can wear bow ties, but bow ties are for everyone who wants to wear them. Um, you don't have to have all the answers, but having these direct conversations can do a lot to counteract the implicit messages and explicit messages kids are receiving all the time. And the more we make it no big deal, the more kids will feel good exploring and learning freely. Um, I think there are some, there's some text here. Awesome. So these are just some quick ideas. You could make and share a class list about what kids call their grownups. Um, Teo calls his parents, Oma and Papi. What do you call your grownups? You can make a class list. Um, they go through the ballet positions one through five. So that lends itself well to sequencing and counting. There's a lot of conversations about what does it mean to be brave? You could make a class list on the board. And then lastly, Kit was telling us all about the great music in this book. Um, you could have kids do, uh, every family bring in a song that they love to dance to and make a class playlist and everybody loves a dance party. So that's also just some fun ideas to think about as you bring Teo's Tutu into your learning spaces. I'm so glad we're recording this because I'm over here furiously scribbling notes of my own. So I, um, I'm grateful that I'll get to go back and think more deeply about some of these suggestions too. Um, we also have a suggestion later in which I think I referenced some pretty aggressive karaoke. Um, so maybe we can combine some of that playlist with some of, uh, some of our classroom karaoke down the line too. All right, I wanna pull back for just a second. It looks like our chat has been fairly quiet, but if you do have questions, please do feel free to drop them in there. Um, if you have used these books in your own learning environments and you have other suggestions uh, that some of our participants might appreciate hearing, please feel free to share those as well. Um, we welcome your thoughts. In the meantime, I'm gonna move us on to the next set of books and start this section with Kind Like Marsha. The subtitle here is Learning from LGBTQ Plus Leaders. This is written by Sarah Prager with illustrations by Cheryl Guzday, and it is from Running Press Kids. This is a collective biography, which means it um, celebrates Marsha as well as 13 other individuals, LGBTQ Plus leaders, including some lesser known folks, representing a pretty wide range of identities and spanning several decades of impactful work. The biographies here are fairly short, they're pretty discreet, and the illustrations are bright and very cheery, which lends some accessibility for this title, um, as well as some appeal to a younger audience. So the 14 subjects are also, they are racially and ethnically diverse. Um, so this is a very inclusive nonfiction classroom selection. Next, we have Peaceful Fights for Equal Rights by Rob Sanders with illustrations by Jared Andrew Shore from Simon & Schuster. This one is actually a 2018 book that we brought back. It has continued to be very timely. It is an abecedary, which is a sort of librarian funky intellectual word for saying it's an ABC book, but it's a pretty subtle ABC book. It's not a very heavy handed one. Um, it is equal parts call to action and kind of a primer in activism vocabulary. So just to give you uh, a, little, a little snippet of the first couple of pages, it says, assemble, take action, create allies, make buttons, make banners, make bumper stickers too. Boycott, boycott, boycott. This book features cut paper illustrations featuring a wide range of abilities, skin tones, and approaches to peaceful protest. And it includes an author's note as well as a glossary of some of the featured terms to help extend some connections outside the classroom. If you're a kid like Gavin, the true story of a young trans activist by Gavin Grimm and Kyle Lukoff, illustrated by Jay Yang from Catherine Teigen Books. So, Speaking of activism, you might already be familiar with Gavin's name from the fairly high profile lawsuit against Gloucester County School Board for not letting Gavin use the boys' bathroom, the bathroom of his choice. Gavin won that lawsuit against the school board. They had to pay a $1.3 million settlement. This book is a story about choices and it's about the choices that we make and the choices that others try to make for us. 
and the choice to speak up and not stay silent when others make choices that you disagree with. This book asks open-ended questions and it encourages readers to believe in themselves and to stand up for what they believe in. I love the palette of this book. It uses a lot of pinks and blues and purples and the digital illustrations really center Gavin both literally and metaphorically in this story. Speaking of pinks and blues, next we'll talk about pink, blue and you questions for kids about gender stereotypes. This is written and illustrated by Elise Gravel with Michael Blaise, and it is from Anne Schwartz Books, which is an imprint of Random House. If you have seen Elise Gravel's Disgusting Critters series, and I highly recommend her cockroach book if you have not, uh, or if you happen to see her killer underwear invasion book that came out last year, you know that she does a truly terrific job at using comics to create informational texts that broach serious subjects on really kid-friendly terms. So here she is breaking down gender identities and stereotypes into really accessible terms using prompting questions to help young readers think about their own lives and the lives of their peers. Um, they cover pronouns here, historical bias, gender expression, and more. And then finally, in this section, we have Kapea Mahu by Hinalea Moa Wong Kalu, Dean Hamer, Joe Wilson, and illustrated by Daniel Sousa from Coquila Penguin Books. This is a dual language story. It leads first with Olelo Nilahu, Niahu with English following. And that is true actually for the print version as well as for the audiobook version of this as well. Uh, this is a traditional story from Hawaii about the Mahu, who are healers from Tahiti who were neither male nor female, but quote, a mixture of both in mind, heart, and spirit, end quote. The Mahu settled in Waikiki to share their healing wisdom with Hawaiians, and they left behind several large boulders as part of that legacy. The boulders were buried and nearly forgotten over time, but the story of the Mahu persisted and this book helps reclaim their history from erasure. There is a corresponding film, and as I mentioned, a wonderful audiobook recorded um, by the author. Um, and yes, uh, Elisa is just dropping into the chat. This is one of a few books that we featured that was um, acknowledged by the Stonewall Book Award Committee at the American Library Association's Youth Media Awards just this past Monday. So um, really excited about that. So um, next slide, please. And Alana is going to talk to us about Kind Like Marsha. I'm going to actually Oh, Elisa is going to do this It's all one. good. Sorry, Elisa is um, going to take us from here. So something that I love about this particular collective biography is that it is short enough that it could be read theoretically front to back in one sitting. And it still functions like many other collective biographies do where you can chunk it up and read it with children in pieces. And if you go to the next slide, I think this lends itself really well to a picture of the day routine or a picture of the day curriculum. I first learned about this type of uh, routine from a colleague of mine named Dave Coletta. Uh, Dave and his colleague, Emily Sutton, do picture of the day every single day with a group of kindergartners at my school. So each day what the class does is they gather and the kids are given a picture to observe closely. And they ask the kids, they look at the picture and they say, what do you see and what do you think? And the teachers then record what the children say and use those uh, insights as a jumping off point for discussions about all sorts of topics, including current events, change makers, and historical moments. And through this routine, the kids are analyzing, they're observing, they're inferencing, and a picture allows everyone, no matter their reading ability, to participate and engage. Uh, so kids with background knowledge are able to share everything that they know, and then the information can be discussed and scaffolded by the grownups in a constructive and age appropriate way. And I think that uh, I, with this particular book, because of the formatting, there's always the information on one side of the spread and the image of the person on the other side of the spread. You could really just focus on one of those illustrations, or you could look at a real photograph, or you could put both side by side. 
just as an aside, I shared this Lego picture because my colleague Dave was also on the Lego reality show and him and his colleague, Richard Dryden, just did this whole Lego series called Awesome Black Creativity, where they made uh, images for the alphabet. Every letter stood for a uh, black creative in history and M was for Marsha P. Johnson. So that's just a fun aside and who doesn't love Lego? So for the next slide, if you were doing the picture of the day curriculum with Audre Lorde, for example, you could either start with just the photograph of Audre Lorde or you could use the illustration page from the book and then you would document the kids thinking. That's a big deal here because it speaks to the approach that helps deepen their understanding and their engagement and it creates that culture of thinking in your library or your school or your learning space. And it also shows utmost respect for kids as learners and thinkers because it invites them to create these habits, but then you're also sharing their thinking out with the wider community. So when you have the text of the page that you're reading about Audre Lorde, the kids already have built up all of this thinking and understanding, but then when you post the kids' thoughts, maybe you post it on the wall outside the classroom or you, if your learning space is outside, you might have a sidewalk chalk on the sidewalk or something, but everyone who comes near can learn about Audre Lorde, but they can also learn about what all the kids thought about Audre Lorde as they were learning about Audre Lorde. And that just contributes to this culture of thinking, this culture of learning and this culture of inclusion. If you go to the next slide, it shows an image of what the end pages of this book look like. These have traits and actions that are exemplified in each of the book's pages. And this is just a really helpful journal prompt or writing prompt. How are you expressive like Sappho or artistic like Frida Kahlo or determined like Sylvia Rivera? Um, if you had enough of these, you could even have the kids make their own book. And if you go to the next slide, these are just a couple other quick little ideas. You could map out where each of these individuals did work or were born that can support geographical awareness. And the same goes with timelines. So I've seen learning spaces where there is a timeline that is put up and then all year as kids learn about a moment in history or a new person, they find where on the timeline that person or that event would go. And it is true that long ago and far away is kind of tough to grasp for early childhood aged kids developmentally, but it can't help to physically symbolize um, the times across the room. And it can support kids' understandings of say, the difference between when X Gonzalez lived today and when someone like Leonardo da Vinci was alive. And then lastly, this is just a great prompt for continuing mini research. Kids could each pick someone, go home, learn more with their families, and then come back to share more of what they learned with the whole group. And if you are a librarian, it can help jumpstart exploration of digital resources too. So you could say, hey, we learned about Josephine Baker in this book. I wonder if there's anything on World Book Online about Josephine Baker, let's try that out. And you can use this to sort of jumpstart your exploration with other library tools and resources. So there's more to say about this book, but I will stop for now and hand it over to Kit. Or Alana, sorry. I think we're gonna actually, yeah, no thanks. I think we're gonna move, move over to Alana, keep going with Kapeyamahu. Awesome. Yeah. So um, we'll jump into Kapeyamahu. Um, if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, one powerful um, artifact, I think, that's in the back of many books is the author's note. Um, and I think that's a really valuable place to go as educators as well. Um, when I finished Kapeyamahu, I found the author's notes here and noticed that um, they were really writing this book as a way to celebrate their identity and as also a way to celebrate and remember their history. Um, and that just made an immediate connection to me to the writing that we can do um, with students and to conversations that we can have around identity and to building learning spaces um, all around identity. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. 
So I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about identity books. Um, and here is just an example from one of my kindergarten classes. Um, we do a deep study of identity at the beginning of every school year. I think it's a really great way to kick off the year, to get to know each other, and also to spend time learning about ourselves. Um, like Lisa was saying, you know, we're all constantly changing and evolving, and it's nice to learn about who we are at one point in the year, and then to continue to reflect on who we are and how we change and grow throughout the course of a school year. Um, so in these identity books with these kindergartners, we thought about four parts of our identity. We thought about parts of our inner identity, something that somebody couldn't tell about you just by looking at you, part of our outer identity, part of your identity that you were born with, and then part of your identity that will change. And the kiddos get to interpret these in lots of different ways. You can see um, part of um, my inner identity for this kiddo here, I like to swim, something you might not be able to tell about them by looking at them, but that they can share that with you and let them know, let you know about that. Part of the outer identity, I like my smile. Part of my identity I was born with, I have a mom. And then part of my identity that will change, I like my skin color. The student was thinking about how like over time, we, we had also read a book about melanin. And we were talking about um, the sun and he, he was particularly noticing his freckles that you can see in that illustration there. So all of these um, pieces tie together to create a book. We put um, all these students' pages together. Um, this in particular, I just wanted to say in any narrative writing that you do in the classroom where it's an opportunity for students to tell their stories, um, this connects to a conversation uh, we were having actually just before our workshop kicked off, where we were talking about how a lot of books right now in the LGBT space are written by um, parents. And so the importance of having voices of students, uh, of kids, of people with lived experiences um, too, and not just parents reflecting on their children's experience, um, that's really powerful in your classroom. Um, building that up, creating libraries, create, uh, empowering students as writers and storytellers um, that builds, you know, the future of the stories that we'll get to read um, down the line. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. All of this discussion of identity, um, I want to say, like, doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes out of a lot of work around understanding what identity is. In kindergarten, I always define identity as what makes you, you. And I think that's really concrete for students and a great way to start the conversation. Um, this is something that gets developed over the course of a year. This is a photo of our chart um, at the end of a school year. You can see how it started and how it ended. You can probably see those clear delineations, right? It began by what makes you you? I like to do a lot of different things. It depends on the foods I like to eat, my family, um, the places we like to visit. And then as we learn more and grow more as a community, you know, that really changes and evolves, right? It becomes like skin color, your name, your culture, your gender, your race, all of those things become um, components of our identity that we build on throughout the course of a year. Um, so how do we do that? Um, the identity books are one great way. As I said, narrative writing is another great way. Um, there's lots of ideas, self-portraits, um, getting a little creative here. You know, typically you do have students come in and do a self-portrait in the beginning of the year in those early grades. Um, but thinking about, is there a way that they could actually not only just reflect their outside identity, but reflect aspects of their inside identity too. Um, one year we had students make these little bubbles, we called them, where they put parts of their inside identity, something you wouldn't know about by looking at them. And we actually had them place those bubbles all around their self-portrait so that when you looked at it, you not only saw their picture of themselves, but also all the things that are component parts of who they are. Um, this could also tie into studying places that you love, places that you feel safe. That translated into us building um, amazing home little spaces where that we love, that we feel safe, and then building ourselves as little identity dolls that could live in those, um, those safe spaces. 
This also ties in early in kindergarten to, of course, like a name study is something you might be doing in phonics or in reading anyway. It's a great way to tie in conversations about where you got your name, um, where your name came from. That could be something that goes home to families for, for students to discuss. Um, a favorite thing I actually um, just did my last year in the classroom were these identity Venn diagrams. Um, Venn diagrams are a common thing to talk about in math. What a fun way to do them in, in a different way. We had students put themselves on one side and their friend on another side and find all the differences and all the similarities between the two of them. And that led to great conversation. Um, you can imagine the things that were talked about in the classroom, you know, like, I don't like, you know, birthday cake, but that's okay that you like birthday cake, you know, having a lot of those conversations. Um, it kind of reminds me also of what Elisa was saying at Teos Tutu about the language that we use with students. That language of some is so important. That could even tie into like a graphing activity. Like some of us like cake, some of us prefer, you know, a lollipop, whatever the case might be. Um, and then lastly, an I am poem. That's a, a kind of a classic um, way to learn a little bit more about yourself and about your community. How fun to have like a poetry slam at the end of that where students get to share their poems and a piece of their identity with their whole class or with the broader community. All right, next slide, please. Sorry, I've been talking for a minute, but I'll just wrap up by um, talking about the anti-bias education goals. Um, this is where a lot of my work in, um, in, in this uh, identity space is grounded. Um, these goals are from the Nas National Association of, education, of the Education of Young Children, NAEYC. And the goals were actually something that my school at this time had grounded in, and we'd created a scope and sequence across um, K through five to utilize these goals. But I think it's a really nice place to ground yourself. In kindergarten land, we really lived in the identity and diversity goals. That's so appropriate for children at that age. Um, I love this. They will demonstrate awareness, confidence, family pride, and positive social identities. Like that's that's our goal for everyone in, in the world, you know, and, and for our students. So next slide, please. Awesome. I'm going to pull back again for just a second. We had a handful of book recommendations during that last discussion. Uh, those came in through the chat. Do we have any questions at this point about either the work or the book titles? Quiet. Okay. We'll keep going. All right. Okay. I'm going to keep going with some book talking for you then some additional titles you might want to add to your list if they're not already in your classroom. The Sublime Miss Stacks by Rob Perlman, illustrated by Danny Jones, and this book is from Bloomsbury. Uh, and Bloomsbury actually did a really lovely thing. They did a book giveaway for something like over 200 librarians were able to get a copy of this book, um, which was really very, very gracious of them. Um, and Kepe Amahu was also supported by Penguin. So we, we appreciate when the publishers um, appreciate you all and the work that you are doing and share books with you. So, uh, The Sublime Miss Stacks, a librarian secretly swaps his staid demeanor for a glittery alter ego who delivers a showstopper story time in this very energetic and incredibly affirming picture book. It is designed to inspire some serious classroom karaoke. So this is the one I was suggesting. We could pair up with Teo's tutu and maybe do some, some dance throwdowns there. Uh, this is uh, a story that has really warm and very inclusive digital illustrations featuring incidental queer representation throughout in the background. Uh, and I really love the way in this text that the author welcomes everyone in. It's very playful and very positive. Twas the Night Before Pride, also available in Spanish, is La Vispera de Orgullo by Joanna McClintock, illustrated by Juana Medina. And this one we also have, as I mentioned, uh, available in Spanish, and it was translated by David Bowles. 
published by Candlewick. In this story, twas the night before Pride and folks are busy packing their snacks and tuning their tubas and putting finishing touches on those costumes and signs for the parade. With really gentle rhymes here and illustrations that bring incredible supportive background content, this book offers the origin story putting Stonewall as the catalyst for the march that we participate in annually now. This actually is believed to be the first non-binary picture book translation in the United States, which I really appreciate. So if you are not familiar with David Bowles's work, otherwise I highly recommend his writing in children's literature. Love Violet by Charlotte Sullivan Wilson, illustrated by Charlene Chua from FSG or Macmillan Kids. Mira races like the wind. Mira has a leaping laugh and Mira makes Violet's heart skip. But Violet gets really flustered whenever Mira approaches her in the classroom or on the playground. So when, Viol when Valentine's Day rolls around, Violet stops second guessing how she feels and she works up the courage to let Mira know. This book is the recent winner of the Stonewall Book Award, Children's Book Award. Uh, Elisa mentioned Kapea Mahu earlier was another book recognized. Uh, and this one is obviously very well-timed, especially well so coming up on Valentine's Day right now. And then we have I Love You Because I Love You by Moon T. Vaughn with illustrations by Jessica Love. And this is from Catherine Teigen Books. There are countless ways to share and express your love. And this gorgeously illustrated, wonderfully inclusive story with very spare text gets right to the heart of a few of those. It has a subtle call and response format and double page spreads that celebrate love across a wide range of relationships. It's a quiet story about the evolution and the power of relationships in many, many forms. I appreciate that it is multi-generational, that it represents a range of skin tones with racial and ethnic cues, and then relationships and abilities in this story. So I think we have a few of these that we are going to discuss. Next slide, please. All right, Twas the Night Before Pride first. Awesome. Um, I'm really excited to talk about Twas the Night Before Pride. Um, and it actually ties in um, really well with um, peaceful fights for equal rights as well. So I kind of think those are a great pairing there. Um, next slide, please. Um, I just pulled this out from the Common Core State Standards for my fellow educators. <laughs> this is, um, you know this very well. Um, I particularly pulled out the text types and purposes standard for writing. It's w.yourgradelevel.1. Um, and this is uh, the place where we talk about opinion writing in the Common Core State Standards. So I just pulled out an example from kindergarten and an example from second grade where you can see um, the growth in opinion writing across those grade spans. Um, and the reason I think that can be really powerful tied to Twas the Night Before Pride, um, next slide please, is that this is a really great tie-in to talking to students about activism and where activism can um, come out in literacy through opinion writing. Um, so I think that message that we can stand up for what we believe in. Over here on the left side, um, I actually took a chart that I was using with my students about things that opinion writers can do. Opinion writers can make a poster or a sign, a card, a letter, a song, a list, a petition, a book, all of these things. Um, we said actually not only can opinion writers do them, but activists can do them. And that's how you can share the things that you believe in with other people. And so you can see we made some additions because it wasn't, uh, uh, we had more ideas that were beyond the scope of this poster. So we just added them on. A student said, um, activists can make something. Um, that's a picture of a, a little free library, which was one of the ideas that a student came up with. Um, the other idea was you can tell people about it. And then the third idea was you could also write a poem. So they wanted to add those on. Um, and I, I, my class um, 
one particular year really ran with this idea of telling people. And that really ties into that peaceful march and that standing up for what you believe in by talking about it and telling other people. So you can see here on the right, after lots of class conversations, lots of work on opinion writing, developing our opinions, um, students decided to make posters and signs that we actually then took around school on our very own pride march. Um, and that was really, really special. Um, and it was actually something that we got to do with our buddy class. So the fifth graders joined us in that, that we could really spread that message around school. Um, we have equal rights for all being one poster, love being, you know, a great kindergarten example of a poster, um, spreading our message um, and doing it in a peaceful way and talking about ways that we can um, share our opinion using our opinion writing um, to tie that into activism and tie that into these great texts. Next slide, please. Thanks, Alana. And we had some good questions in the chat asking about a list of these books. The books are all listed on the Pride and Less Prejudice website, and I dropped some links there, and Elisa dropped some others as well um, to specific places on the PLP website if you are looking to see them captured um, in one spot. Hopefully, you'll be able to find those there. All right, so next up, we have Mr. Watson's Chickens by Jared Dapier, illustrated by Andrea Serini from Chronicle Books. And um, Elisa mentioned in the chat as well, this is another great, very musical story. Uh, in this book, there is a song, I am not brave enough to sing it uh, publicly, much less on a recorded Zoom, uh, but power to those of you who are willing to do this in your classroom. So Mr. Watson and Mr. Nelson live in a lovely little house with a teeny tiny yard, two dogs, three cats, and a handful of chickens. Every morning, Mr. Watson counts his chickens, one, two, three, but it turns out that three chickens can actually lay a lot of eggs, and soon there are chickens absolutely everywhere, 456 of them, and that includes Anne Agnes, who sings quite the chicken song. So 456 chickens proved to be just a few too many for this pair. Uh, so they set out to slim down their nest and the chickens escape and cause a bit of a ruckus. So I love the boisterous story here, the incredibly detailed illustrations, uh, tons of what we call Easter eggs in the industry. There's lots of wonderful, just really delightful hidden bits inside the artwork here, including some send ups to some other tremendous uh, children's writers and illustrators like Maurice Sendak and Tommy DiPaolo. Uh, I also really appreciate that Mr. Watson and Mr. Nelson's relationship is not a problem that's being addressed here. Um, and it's not even really the point of the story. It's really just about some chickens. So um, that is Mr. Watson's chickens. Aaron Slater illustrator also published is Aaron Soñador Illustrador by Andrea Beatty and illustrated by David Roberts. This is from a uh, Abrams Books. And many of you might already be familiar with the Questionnaires books um, or perhaps the spinoff, the Netflix show, Ada Twist Scientist, which is, I know, quite popular. This series delivers again, and this time it's with a really tender story about a very creative little boy who loves books and stories, but finds that words are just squiggles when he sits down to try to read them. So when he is daunted by a writing assignment, Aaron really blossoms when he is able to express himself through spoken word and through art instead. So the cadence that you have grown to expect from the Iggy Peck architect, Rosie Revere engineer, that's back in this story. And it is joined with some pretty incredible illustrations. And honestly, I think you should get this book just to see the spread of the bedroom wall decor in Aaron's room. It's fabulous. But this is a warm and inclusive and really wonderfully supportive story. And the font is dyslexia friendly, which is a nice touch here. A Whale of a Tea Party. This is a series starter. It is written by Erica Pearl with illustrations by Sam Ailey from Simon Spotlight, Simon & Schuster imprint. This story introduces three characters, whale, quail, and snail. And in this 
book Whale is Lonely and Dreaming of the Day When She Will Find Some Friends. She throws a tea party for the friends that she has, who happen to just be some rocks. Quail arrives first, and then Snail, who to be fair, kind of looks a little bit like a rock, so there's some confusion, but the three of them become really quick buddies. This is the first time that Pride and Lust Prejudice has selected for a book bundle a uh, early reader. And this is believed to be the first early reader that features non-binary character representation. So we're glad to know that this series is continuing. Our hope in selecting this book among many picture books is that it will help us reach some of our emerging and independent readers at some of the older grade levels that we serve. And finally, for this selection, we have Mama and Mommy and Me in the Middle, written by Nina LaCour and illustrated by Kailani Juanita from Candlewick. When Mommy leaves on a Monday morning, the week stretches out and it is long and frustrating for a child who deeply feels the absence. When the child and Mama go about their routines, there is just a lot missing. And Mommy's return on Sunday triggers really big feelings before the child can settle back into her safe and happy space, sandwiched in a hug between two incredibly loving parents. I appreciate that this story is tender and relatable for any kid who has missed somebody that they love. And again, the representation here is not an issue to be solved. The point is centering the child in their emotional experience. So let's hear a little bit more about some of these books. Next slide, please. Who's going to kick us off with Mama and Mommy and Me in the Middle? I think Alana, you're first. All right, great. Sorry about that. Um, go ahead and next slide, please. Oh, yes. Um, we are talking with Mama, Mommy, and Me in the Middle about um, a really fun project uh, that I love to do um, with students called Family in a Bag. Um, so how this works is I, I take all the little um, family, the little people from my dollhouse. Um, I, I particularly loved these um, examples of the wooden dolls. Um, that's what I had in my dollhouses. Um, I think they're really fun. You can manipulate their legs and arms. And I would put them into thoughtfully curated um, groupings and put them together in paper, brown paper bags. So some of the bags might have two people in them. Some bags might have four, six, eight, um, different numbers of people in them, different ages, different genders, different ev all the different dolls represented. And um, students would open up their, their family bag and in a group work together to decide who was who in this family. And they would actually build and create um, a family. Um, they would decide the names of the family members. They would decide the different roles in the family that everyone was going to play. And then they would start to think about what does this family like to do together? Where does this family live? And along this process, students would make some decisions about, for example, who are the people in this family? And then the next time the family bags came out, they would come out with a letter from the family, um, from me, but from the family, um, talking a little bit about um, things that that family may have experienced in the in the week that they were gone. You know, we we went to the zoo together, or um, you know, we we moved into a new house, or whatever the story might be for that family. And then the students would open the family bag, they would read the letter from their family, and then do some activity related to that. So um, they would talk about and in, in one letter the needs and wants of that family. And that would lead students to building um, a house that would, or, or a place to live that would accommodate that family. So you can see an example of quite an elaborate um, house design there, but it had rooms for the different members of the family. And this was a real um, opening also to lots of conversations about um, 
similarities and differences. How is this family similar to my family? How is this family different to my family? This would also lead to a lot of work around family portraits, um, talking about what our families like to do together. Again, this is a great place for narrative writing to live as well, stories about your own family, and it ties in super well to reading books about families. And that's just a great way that mama and mommy and me in the middle could fit into um, this type of talking about family. Next Thanks, slide. Alana. Some ideas that I have for this book include lots of writing and play practice. Um, you can replicate what the characters do. So they make a grocery list. Why not practice making a grocery list? They make a big welcome home banner. What is a message that you can put on a banner as a class? Maybe create something together as a group. And then it's a subtle part of the story, but in the illustrations, I just love Kehlani Juanita's art so much. I am obsessed with looking at every page, but there is a page where a town is being made out of recycled materials for the kids' playthings. And that would just be such a fun thing to do out of recyclables, build a little city, have your toys play in it, and then work on labeling what each of those creations is. Um, this book also has a cadence that goes through the days of the week, so that offers wonderful opportunities for going through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, as well as kids sharing more to Alana's point about um, talking about our families. What are routines that you do with your family? If you have things that you always do after you brush your teeth or every Saturday morning before you get out of bed, is whatever. It's an opportunity for kids to bring their lives into the learning space and to share more about their lives um, with everyone. Um, there's a social emotional connection to this book that I think is really helpful and important. Um, the character goes through all the feelings and something that the counselors at my school use for helping kids recognize their emotions internally and externally is called the mood meter. So it's basically a square that is divided into four quadrants, red, blue, green, and yellow. And each represents a different set of feelings. And they're grouped together based on like pleasant or unpleasant or high energy or low energy. So it can be a tool, like a visual tool for talking about your feelings, either at one moment in time or over the course of a day or over the course of a week. So you might even say like, I'm feeling in the red today. I'd like to be in the green. Hmm, what's a word that can help me describe how I'm feeling? Oh, I'm feeling lonely right now. And it's just a, another way to help express feelings, develop self-awareness. And over time, it just becomes habit. You don't look at the boxes as much, but it becomes part of your vocabulary. And it can also help reinforce strategies for regulating or managing emotions and give language to talk about our feelings. And I think that this book, as the character goes through a lot of different feelings, you could kind of use that side by side with the mood meter um, in a really helpful way. And then Lastly, there's a gorgeous bouquet that is created for one of the mothers at the end of this story. And uh, what an opportunity for special events like holidays or special friends day where kids are crafting something through a library program or through a classroom activity or even a party of sorts. Um, this book could lend itself really well to uh, extension craft or activity to make a bouquet for someone special in your life, what are you going to give to someone that you love? Next slide, please. So this whale of a tea party book, I did, I do love this book and I had a little correction about, I'm not sure that this was the first early reader to have a character that uses they, them pronouns. I know that there was one that Kit and I both put into the chat that came out a couple months before. I don't know if uh, that book, the Five Magic Rooms book is the first, it's the first that I became aware of. So that would be an interesting thing if anybody else knows of one that came out 
before we then. actually have another one dropped oh, yeah. in the chat as well so we're gonna get a nice little list going which is fantastic so i really appreciate um yeah. thank you for the correction there um i didn't mean to be extremist we're excited <laughs> that this is the first time we have featured uh, yeah. an early reader um and it is certainly the first early reader for us that has a non-binary character because it's our first early reader to begin with and i'm glad first. to know it looks like we have a few others already in the hopper to consider for future book bundles so thanks to you and to um to pat for giving us um giving me some corrections there so thank that's you. amazing so with whale of a tea party there are great scenario opportunities here for role playing how do we interact with making new friends how do we uh, do conflict resolution when we're arguing over something in our learning space. I think that explicitly using these characters interactions as sort of a setting the stage and then talking through what the kids might do is really helpful. If you go to the next slide, just a couple other ideas. Who doesn't love a rock friend? Um, we know that Whale was not content only having rock friends. But I think that talking about these different rocks and trying to describe them through adjectives would be a fun language play activity. Also, with the tea party, you can do recipes with cookies. You can practice writing invitations. You can have a tea party. Um, and then you can work through those scenarios. And then because of the pronoun exemplified through this story, uh, Snail actually has a little business card that says, hi, my pronouns are they, them. Uh, a great introduction if you haven't already had conversations with kids about pronouns or other words that make kids feel good, words that make everyone feel comfortable. This is a great tool for doing that because it's there, but it's not to what other folks have already said in the chat. It's just who this character is. It's not a problem. It's not anything but their regular day to day life. And we're normalizing. And I think that the more it's normalized, the more it's the everyday, the more the more everyone has gender freedom and freedom of all sorts to use whatever words feel good for them. So if you go to the next slide, Mr. Watson's chickens, I'm not going to say a lot about it, but if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to show everyone this double page spread. Because I think this alone exemplifies, if you aren't already familiar with this book, how much is going on here. Uh, imagine what would happen if you looked closely and just had every kid pick a chicken and tell a story about what is happening in this picture. It can support with narrative skills and it can also just um, be a what, it's just so fun and so funny and playful. You can do I spies till the cows come home with this. There's just so many things going on. Every time I look at this book, I see something new. And if you go to the next slide for library activities, you can do, um, if you teach like the parts of a book or what a title is, something that I've had success doing with second graders is covering up the title of this book and talking to kids about what do we know about what a title is? How does a title function? And then you read the story and you have each kid in the group uh, develop like what would they title the book and that allows them an opportunity to demonstrate their understanding of the plot and also what a title is. And then as everyone shares what they would title the book, you can do a big reveal and show what Jarrett Dapier and Andrea Sarumi titled the book and it's very exciting and kids have lots of opinions about whatever the title is. Because this book is so visual, I just want to do a shout out to visual thinking strategies, which is really popular in museum education, especially with the visual arts. It's where you can help kids analyze and interpret art by discussing it in community with one another. Usually in museum education, the questions asked are, what do you see? What makes you say that? What more can we find? That language is fine, but more appropriately, depending on the age of your readers, you might ask simply, what do you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? And then document students thinking along the path. Um, a lot of chicken embryology tie-ins here. If you are in a learning space that does that, I know not everybody does 
And then to Kit's point earlier about karaoke and singing, I have had conversations with the author of this book about how nobody knows for sure the melody of the song that makes the chickens famous. We know the text and we can see the images of all of the chickens singing along. But if you ask a reader, how does shooby do wonky pow baka baka into chow chow sound as music in one's head, you're going to get a bunch of different results. And I think that that is just really fun because it's another way of demonstrating how we're all coming to every book with a million different lenses and a million different experiences. And it can be playful and it can be fun and it can be a way of building community. If you go to the next slide, I just wanted to show you the last, it's the first image of the book and it's the last image that I'm showing here because I think that this scene setup, very simple. Here's a house and here's some flags outside. Can, if you want it to, really do a lot of work in having conversations about how do we use words to show who we are or what we believe and how do we show who we are and what we believe without words. We can't make any assumptions straight up just from one image alone, but we can learn something about who lives in this house or what their values are. And I think that this really connects well to questions about symbols and images kids are seeing everywhere in their everyday life. Are there signs in their neighborhood? Do they see stickers on people's cars? Are there flags in the library or in the classroom? And what do these things show us? And what do these things tell us about what the people there believe? And it doesn't have to be a big capital C conversation, but these are everyday things that we should be naming and discussing and normalizing as we read and explore all books with kids, not just books with queer content, however subtle or explicit. I think that this normalization is really important. Next slide. I mean, I kind of want to just stop on that note. That was sort of a mic drop moment, I think. Um, but we're going to pull back just a little bit here and uh, give some credits. Um, as librarians and educators, we feel pretty strongly about uh, uh, credit where it is due for materials and such. The slide deck was made in Google Slides. Uh, and we pulled our book images from various sources um, with permission of the publishers to share uh, the content and um, hopefully all uh, under fair use. Um, photos are the presenter's own uh, and the interior images, as I said, are um, fair use here. So the chat box has been fairly cool. Quiet, but I would love to stop for a second and um, maybe we can just go back to the um, presenters. Let's see, do we have any more slides left? I think that I think that's it. Um, I did want to give you uh, just a, again our landing. Uh, this is our logo. That is our website for Pride and Less Prejudice. If you are interested in additional information, I will drop the website um, down once more uh, just to make it easily accessible. But we are on most of the socials. If you'd like to find us there or tag us, if you are using these books in your classroom and you would like to share. How that is going for you, Pride and Less Prejudice would be absolutely thrilled to hear from you. Um, and we would really welcome your feedback and um, invite you to, to let us know. Um, do we have any questions? No. Quiet. I have something else to, that I'm happy to share. Say it. If there's no Would questions. you please? I just think that um, a lot of folks, a lot of grownups, especially with early childhood, I've noticed a pattern with a lot of grownups that I've worked with is that people are afraid to say the wrong thing. And so they don't say anything. And I just want to offer it up there into the space that kids are always picking up on us grownups reactions. 
whether we're communicating them through language or through behavior and discomfort, and they're absorbing the messages that our behavior is sending all the time. So if you are avoiding a conversation, it sends a message that the conversation is somehow not okay. And if we act comfortable and casual, it speaks volumes because again, all of this is everyday, natural, beautiful human stuff. So I just wanted to throw that out there that if you are working with kids and if a question startles you and you're not sure how to answer it, it's okay to say, I don't know, or I have to think about that, or I'm not sure. Let's learn more together. Uh, take your time, but avoiding it is not avoiding it. And I know everyone here is on the Zoom, so I appreciate folks' efforts to not avoid it by being here. But if that's helpful at all to take back to the folks that you work with and the other grownups in your life, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. I would also add, I think that's super important, Elisa, and, and um, I totally agree. I think um, saying that to students is super powerful because it also shows um, that we are learners too, and that we are constantly learning as well. And so I think that's really critical. Um, I also wanted to say um, that Rebecca Bauer, who is here, um, said uh, or pointed me in the direction of the Human Rights Campaign for their fantastic um, uh, glossary of terms. And they're um, written in a way for adults. But I think thinking about how we would explain um, terms that might come up um, to an adult and then to, you know, a five-year-old or to an eight-year-old to your learners um, is, a, is a great, um, that, that can be a great resource um, to start having some of those um, internal discussions with yourself about how you might explain something um, should it come up. Thanks for dropping that in the chat, Rebecca. I also did just want to clarify based on one of the questions um, that when I say book bundles and available books for Pride and Less Prejudice, we are sending two to three books to educators. We are not shipping all 17 of these books. Um, so if you look, we have combined them in different ways that we think suit classrooms well, but you do have the option of making a specific request based on um, the dynamics in your particular classroom. If there's if there's a need to help facilitate a conversation, you can reach out specifically about that as a new applicant. Okay, well, everyone, thank you very, very much for coming tonight. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. Thank you for being a part of this work. It is absolutely critical for kids, uh, and we are all grateful that you are doing that. I'm going to pass it over to Pride and Less Prejudice founder and executive director, Lisa Foreman. Thank you so much, Kit, and thank you, Alana and Elisa. That was absolutely phenomenal. So much great information, and I think that the chat was quiet because there was so much good information that everybody was feverishly taking notes with all these good ideas. They didn't want to miss a thing. Um, you just provided so much information and so many resources. I think people will be dreaming of ways to use these books in their sleep tonight. So thank you so much for taking the time to, um, to spend with us this evening and share your expertise and your knowledge, your experience. Um, we love our books. We love our teachers and our librarians. All the support that you all give us means so much to us. Um, and we want to be able to keep on doing these professional development workshops quarterly. Um, when we end tonight, I'm going to send a really quick survey by email to all of you who attended. It takes about five minutes. Um, but it's really important for us to know what you liked and what you didn't like and what you hope for next time. And is there an idea that you'd like to see us create? Um, that's where we get some of our best ideas from the teachers that are in the classroom or in the libraries looking to explore different things. So please, if you have time, fill it out for us. It really is very helpful. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to share with you all before we say goodnight is that we do have our next 
workshop set for um, April 25th, um, and it will be creating spaces where transgender and non-binary students thrive. Um, Rebecca Kling, she, her, is an educator, an artist, and an activist, and Vanessa Ford, who's the author of Calvin, which we talked about tonight, um, she, her, and an author and advocate are going to be doing um, a, a little workshop, and I'm just going to read you a, a short paragraph. Um, join us for Rebecca Kling and Vanessa Ford, MAT, to dig into their framework for creating inclusive schools based on their upcoming book, The Advocate Educator's Handbook, Creating Inclusive Schools with Transgender and Non-Binary Students Thrive. It's going to be coming out in 2024 by Jossie and Bass. And Rebecca and Vanessa will share their framework for inclusive schools, educate, affirm, include, and interrupt. Participants will develop knowledge and skills to apply to their school settings the next day, as well as resources to support further professional development. So I'm really looking forward to this one. And I hope that you'll be able to come and join us for that one as well. So again, thank you, Alana, Alisa, Kit. It was absolutely fantastic. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight.